Ever heard of a soldier rocking a blue velvet smoking jacket right in the middle of a war zone? Sounds like a movie. Well, that's just a glimpse of Staff Sergeant Jerry Mad Dog Shriver, the guy we're diving deep into today. It should be good. He's uh, one of those figures who almost seems too incredible to be real Green Beret, legend in the Vietnam War, and a total enigma, even to those who served alongside him. You know, what makes his story even more interesting is where it comes from a Dark Docs YouTube video. Wow. So we're dealing with firsthand accounts, declassified missions, even maybe a few rumors, all add up to the mystery of Mad Dog. Okay, so this YouTube video, it claims Shriver was practically born for action. Well, according to the video, even as a kid in Florida back mm -hmm. in the 40s, Jerry Shriver was obsessed with stories of World War II heroes, almost like he was, you know, hardwired for a life less ordinary. So how does a kid obsessed with war heroes end up earning a nickname like Mad Dog in the jungles of Vietnam? He didn't waste any time, that's for sure. Join the Army Young Aced Airborne School. We're talking Screaming Eagles, 101st Airborne. But even that wasn't enough for Shriver. Pushed himself further, taking on Special Forces training, earning his Green Beret. Wow, talk about driven. The guy was already exceeding expectations before most people even figure out what they want to do with their lives. It makes you wonder, was it patriotism, thirst for adventure, or something more? Now, that's the question that continues to intrigue folks who study Shriver's life. What we do know is his timing. It lined up perfectly with Vietnam escalating. The U.S., they needed soldiers with Shriver's unique skills, you know, for unconventional warfare. And he was, well, to put it mildly, eager to get in on the action. So Shriver arrives in Vietnam, ready to use all that training. But what was he getting himself into? What does unconventional warfare even look like in this context? Now, this is where things get interesting. Shriver ends up joining MACV SOG, a super secret unit operating in Vietnam. Oh, I've heard of this. Imagine, best of the best army, Marines, Navy, Air Force, even the CIA, all coming together for missions so classified, they remain shrouded in secrecy even today. Okay, now we're talking serious cloak and dagger stuff. Mm -hmm. So no wonder we don't know much about Shriver's missions, if they were top secret. But there's got to be a reason this guy stood out, even in a unit as elite as MECV SOG, right? Absolutely. Even with limited information, Shriver's reputation, it precedes him. One of the video's most compelling points comes from Jim Fleming, a fellow soldier, went on to receive the Medal of Honor. He called Shriver the quintessential warrior loner, always training, constantly preparing, almost like he was, you know, preparing for something extraordinary. That paints quite a picture. But let's talk about that nickname, Mad Dog. Just a catchy name, or did he actually live up to it? Well, from what the video tells us, Mad Dog wasn't just a name, it was a lifestyle. The guy seemed addicted to the adrenaline of combat. Constantly pushing the limits, regular patrols, they weren't enough for Shriver. He'd actually sneak out to join other missions in his downtime, even skipped out on R&R, &R, choosing to head back into the heat of battle. Wait, hold on. He actually chose to go back into combat. Most soldiers would jump at the chance for some rest and recovery. Mm. What does that tell us about his mindset? It's a question that speaks to the core of Shriver, you know? Almost like he felt most alive in the chaos. But this paradoxical nature, it wasn't just on the battlefield. Video describes him rocking a blue velvet smoking jacket, a derby hat while off duty. Seriously, a blue velvet smoking jacket in a war zone. That's quite the image. Right, like something out of a movie. But don't let the fancy clothes fool you. This was still Mad Dog Shriver. Always had multiple pistols on him, often carried captured enemy weapons, AK-47s, even a sawed-off shotgun. So, incredibly skilled, more than a little eccentric. What I'm getting is a man of contradictions. Highly trained warrior, but a taste for the finer things. Drawn to danger, yet deeply loyal to those he thought beside. Exactly. And it's this complexity of these layers that make Jerry Mad Dog Shriver so fascinating. Not just about what he did, but why he did it. And those are the questions we'll keep exploring as we delve deeper into the life and times of Mad Dog Shriver. So we've got Mad Dog Shriver, skilled warrior with a taste for the finer things in life. Drawn to danger, but deeply loyal to his men. Makes you wonder, how did these contrasting sides of his personality actually play out in a war zone? That's a great question, and it's one of the things that makes Schreiber's story so fascinating. This wasn't just a guy playing a role, this was who he was. And one of the most powerful examples, according to the Dark Docs video, was his relationship with the Montanard tribesmen, the ones fighting alongside the U.S. forces. You know, for those of us who weren't around during Vietnam, it might be helpful to unpack that a little. Who exactly were the Montagnards? What was their role? You're right, not everyone listening is a history buff. The Montagnards, 
They were indigenous people from the central highlands of Vietnam. They were known for their uh, incredible tracking skills, their deep knowledge of the jungle, and their fierce loyalty. So essential allies in a war that was often fought in dense, unforgiving jungle. Exactly. And Shriver, well, he recognized their value, not just as soldiers, but as people went beyond the typical soldier-ally dynamic, shared his money and supplies with them, even lived among them in their barracks, really immersed himself in their culture. That's incredible. It would have been so easy for him, especially with his rank, his reputation, to maintain some distance, mm. you know. But he chose to build real relationships with these men. And those relationships weren't just about camaraderie. They were built on mutual respect, trust, forged in the heat of battle. The Dark Docks episode, it shares a story that really highlights this. Apparently, Schweiber had this German shepherd, Klaus, who he had adopted back in Taiwan. He was, well, incredibly loyal to this dog, treated him like family. I'm already sensing this story doesn't end well. You'd be right. Some of the other NCOs, they decided it would be funny to play a cruel prank on Klaus, forcing him to drink beer. Oh, no. When word got back to Schreiber, he was furious, marched straight into the NCO club, .38 revolver in hand, demanded to know who was responsible. Whoa, I bet there were some stunned faces in that club. You can bet on it. Nobody dared to confess, but Shriver, he made it crystal clear. Anyone who messed with Klaus would have to answer to him. And this wasn't just about a dog. It was about loyalty, protecting those under his care, whether they were fellow soldiers or his four-legged companion. And that's a side of mad dog we don't often hear about. Fiercely protective, loyal to a fault, and not afraid to show it even if it meant challenging his fellow soldiers. This episode is really making me rethink things, you know? Challenging my ideas about soldiers, especially in those high-pressure environments like MACV, SOG, makes you wonder, did Shriver's men, particularly the Montagnards, did they reciprocate this loyalty? Absolutely. The bond between Shriver and his men, especially the Montagnards, something special, almost legendary, you could say. They trusted him implicitly, would follow him anywhere. Many believe that this mutual loyalty, it played a crucial role in their survival on numerous occasions. We often hear about the, uh, the ruthlessness of war, the brutality. But Shriver's story reminds us that even in the darkest places, human connection, loyalty, even love can flourish. That's a powerful insight. But we've been kind of dancing around the more classified parts of Shriver's service. What about his missions as part of MACVSOG? What were these guys actually doing out there? You're right. We should dive into that. Now, as you can imagine, details about specific MACVSOG missions are, oh, well, they're hard to come by even today. They were the definition of top secret, highly classified, often taking place deep behind enemy lines and for good reason. Great. But we got to get a little more specific here. What was their objective? What were they trying to accomplish with these clandestine operations? Well, think of MAC Sarga as the ultimate wild card in the Vietnam War. They were tasked with disrupting the enemy by any means necessary. We're talking reconnaissance, sabotage, capturing high-value targets, rescuing down pilots, gathering intel. They were the ghosts of the jungle, the unseen hand disrupting the enemy's plans. And these missions, they weren't your typical large-scale military operations, were they? Not at all. We're talking small teams. Often just two or three American MACV Sagi operators like Shriver paired with a group of indigenous soldiers, most often the Montagnards. They'd be dropped into incredibly hostile territory, vastly outnumbered, limited support, and expected to get the job done. That takes the special kind of soldier, a certain mindset to volunteer for those missions. Absolutely. It took someone who not only excelled in combat, but who thrived on risk, who had unwavering trust in their team, who could make life or death decisions in the blink of an eye. And that's exactly who Mad Dog Shriver was. In fact, he was so effective, so feared by the enemy, that Radio Hanoi, that was the communist propaganda machine, they put a $10,000 bounty on his head. $10,000. They knew he was a force to be reckoned with. A $10,000 bounty. That's insane. Really speaks to the kind of impact he was having. It does. But sadly, as with many stories from the Vietnam War, Shriver's Tale, it takes a turn toward the tragic and the unknown. You're talking about his disappearance in 1969, right? Yeah. What can you tell us about that? Okay, so we're talking about a guy who volunteers for the most dangerous missions in Vietnam, earns a bounty from the enemy, even rocks a blue velvet smoking jacket while dodging bullets, and then he just vanishes. This is insane. Fill me in. It's a wild ride, and the ending is still a mystery, unfortunately. As you said, April 1969, that's when Shriver disappeared. He and his MACV Suji company, they were tasked with raiding an airfield. 
Quan Loi, South Vietnam. Quan Loi. This airfield that had been hit hard by B-52 bombers and Shriver's team was sent in to finish the job. So a pretty standard mission for MECV Sojin, considering what we've learned, what went wrong. This mission, it was cursed from the get-go. Their air support, it had to turn back. Mechanical issue left Shriver and his men completely vulnerable. And if that wasn't bad enough, they landed and walked straight into an ambush. You're kidding. They're trapped, outnumbered, no air support. It's hard to imagine surviving that. Nightmare scenario, a true test. But even facing those odds, Shriver, true to form, he took charge, grabbed his Uzi, his signature weapon, and led a flanking maneuver, charged right into enemy fire alongside his Montagnard brothers in arms. Knowing Shriver, part of him was probably thinking, bring it on. It's possible knowing how he liked to run toward danger. Witnesses say he was last seen charging into the heart of the enemy lines, this, uh, this whirlwind of fury, you know, and then nothing. Gone. Gone. Just like that. No trace. Vanished. The military, of course, they launched search and rescue missions. Never found a sign of him. No body, no equipment, nothing. So what happened? He was officially declared MIA missing in action. Man, that's heartbreaking. So what are the theories? What do people think happened? Well, no shortage of theories, that's for sure. And that's part of what keeps Shriver's story alive, you know? Hanoi, the North Vietnamese government, they claimed they captured and killed him. Even broadcast propaganda about it. Really? But they never offered proof. No body, no personal effects, nothing concrete. So it's basically his word against theirs. And all these decades later, we still don't know for sure. Exactly. And in war, certainty is, well, it's hard to come by. Some experts believe he was captured, died in captivity. Others, they cling to the hope that he survived somehow, maybe escaped. There are even rumors, whispers, really, that he orchestrated the whole thing. Chose to disappear into the jungle rather than return from the horrors he'd seen. Wow. That's a lot to take in. It's both tragic and fascinating that after all this time, Jerry Mad Dog Shriver's fate remains a complete mystery. It really is. And in a way, that mystery, that lack of closure, it makes his story endure, makes us confront the realities of war, the sacrifices made, and the unanswered questions that remain. This deep dive, it's been an emotional roller coaster, that's for sure. We've got this incredible soldier, larger than life, and then poof, vanished. What do you think is the message of Shriver's story. What can we take away from all of this? I think on a personal level, Shriver's story reminds us that even in the most extraordinary circumstances behind every legend, there's a human being with fears, desires, complexities. But on a larger scale, I think his story, or maybe the lack of an ending, it compels us to remember those who never returned home. They had stories, loved ones, their sacrifice, their unanswered fates. It deserves to be remembered. Well said. Jerry Mad Dog. Shriver's story might be shrouded in mystery, but his legacy, the courage, that unconventional spirit, the loyalty it continues to inspire. And as we wrap up this deep dive, I'm left with one question for you. What do you think happened to Mad Dog? Let us know your theories on social media. Until next time, keep exploring, keep asking questions, and keep diving deep. <laughs>